Well, we did it, everybody. We have reached 100,000 subscribers here on this channel. 100,000. I'll be honest, when I started uh, back a year and a half ago, I did not think that we would reach this point so quickly. Of course, I thank each and every one of you that uh, is out there that watch my videos and enjoy my content. Obviously, words are not enough to express my gratitude, so I figured, how about some playing cards? So we don't waste time, the link is down below for the blowout 100,000 subscriber celebration sale event. I should just stop talking. Houseofplayingcards.com right now, 50% off the entire store, but we're only leaving it up for 100 minutes. And if my math serves me, that's over an hour, less than two hours. If you are watching this as I post it, then you have all the time in the world to go and pick up some decks. If you are watching this after the 100 minutes is over, well, I'm sorry, should have hit the bell button. I don't know what I could tell you. If you did miss your, why am I wearing these? If you did miss your chance on grabbing some playing cards, fear not, I am giving away 100 decks to celebrate 100,000. Should be giving away 100,000 decks. But nonetheless, we're gonna share the 100 deck prize with 10 of you guys out there. Click the link down below, it's a Gleam contest and you could go and enter in a few ways. Subscribe here on YouTube, follow me on Instagram. If you did purchase things on either House of Playing Cards or the Blue Crown, you could type in your order number and get 10 points for the entries. The ways to enter are down below and I'll leave that contest up for about a month. And there's gonna be new releases and different things so you'll have your chance to get as many points as possible. So I figured a nice way to commemorate this event and my channel in general and for everything that is to come is to give you sort of a best of, a mix of everything that I've put up, not everything, uh, but my favorite stuff that I've put on this channel since its inception. I know a lot of you guys haven't seen all the videos, so hopefully you'll see something new and learn something that you could put to good use. Do you have, so you know there's 52 cards in the deck, right? because it's important for me to know where it is, but not you, okay? okay. Because you're gonna be the one finding it. Okay. All right, I'm gonna deal the cards out like this, and you're gonna say stop anytime you want, you're just gonna feel it. Right there. I'll leave this card over here. If you would've said stop here, it would've been the five of diamonds. If you would've said stop here, ace of clubs. But you said stop right here. And you said king of hearts? Didn't change your mind. I didn't change my you mind. You want to change your mind now? No. I give you that last choice. Take a look. How? How? That's the question I should be asking you. That's wild. Okay, so this is the stop trick where I deal uh, the, the selected card is fourth from the top at this point. I deal three real cards, right? Three three cards off the top of the deck for real. As I look down at my hands and my, my look is down at the hands like this, right? So everybody looks, and if there were more spectators, you'd see as well. Everybody looks at the hand while I deal. Then after the third one, I take a step back and I say, look, you're gonna say stop anytime you want. You're just gonna feel it, all right? And at this point, I get eye contact with the spectator. Now that's very important because if I keep eye contact, they will keep eye contact. As you saw over here, throughout the whole dealing procedure, she keeps eye contact with me. So before when I used to perform this, I would actually tell them to look me in the eye. Okay, take a look right here and you're just gonna feel it and say stop. Uh, I don't do that so much anymore because I feel like without saying that, I could still keep the eye contact. So try it out, see if, if it doesn't work, if you see them looking down, keep eye contact and the reason for the eye contact is only because I want them to look here and not look at my second deal. This is what I used to do when, when I was not comfortable with my second deal and dealing out for everybody to see doing the trick where the only method was the second deal. So I would tell them look at me in the eye and that was my sort of get around um, of not looking down at my hands. The eye contact is important and you could see how it worked in this video. Uh, she keeps eye contact and I do my second deals after the third real deal. 
All right, so let's get into a blank fan. Uh, this is a reverse fan that you're gonna need to show that the cards are blank. And originally it was done with a Ace of Diamonds cover on top, or Ace of Hearts, one of the aces, the red aces on a cover. You would do a fan just like that with your thumb or your first finger. Uh, I do it with both uh, in your left hand to show that all the cards are uh, in, in fact printed. And if you do it in the opposite hand, that means in the left, and sorry, in the right hand, and you reverse fan it, that means that all the indices are being hidden uh, because obviously on this side of the card there's no index, on this side there is. So it's all a matter of just switching it to the other hand and doing a fan out. It might take a little bit to get looking like a regular fan, so it's just literally we're placing it into the other hand, we're fanning and we're doing this. Now with the Ace of Diamonds technique, you take your thumb and you place it along that so you have the cards just like that, all right? Um, now, when you do it to the spectator without the blank card, just with the ace of diamonds, I would do this first, make sure that nothing is shown, and now move my finger in that position, my thumb, covering it just like that, and now blow and come down and show that all the cards are blank. You've made the deck blank, and you can go ahead, cut the deck, snap your fingers, and now show that the, all the cards are printed, okay? So now the top shot, really quickly, is a way to shoot out the card from the top of the deck but make it look like it's coming from the middle, okay? Now, some subtleties on this that I like to do, we're not doing this move, the simple shot, uh, but just in my top shot experience is to come down with the finger like this as if it's coming out of the middle, do the move, and then again break with the finger, okay? So it looks like it's gonna come out from here and then it comes out and shoots into the right hand. Now, I like this move because it comes out face up, okay? Now, really quickly, the top shots, just things to keep in mind that'll make it easier. Uh, again, Green Magic Volume 1 is where I learned this. It's a Leonard Green move. Your pinky is going to apply pressure and push the packet down. Now, remember, you are squeezing the two uh, top corners with your thumb and your first finger and the pinky is gonna squeeze it down into here, okay? It's very important that all four have pressure on it. One, two, three, four, all right? Even with the base of the thumb so that the pinky could pull it out and kick it out, okay? And at first, it's just literally gonna fall down like this, all right? That's all you're gonna get at first. Uh, but in time, with a little bit of motion, it should just look like that, okay? And you wanna catch it. Uh, uh, it's gonna be hard to catch it in the beginning, so I suggest that you let it just fall on the hand and then grab it, a nice little touch. Uh, but again, do learn it from Leonard Green, the master himself, on that. Uh, you're gonna need your double backer to go on the top of the deck. Now, in the previous video, we did learn the top shot, so using that in combination with the double backer is very nice because remember, the top shot goes like this and it comes out face up. So again, if you do not know, this, go back to uh, the first video. I taught it in very small detail. If you wanted in more detail, go visit Green Magic Volume 1. That's where I learned it from, but I'm sure you could learn it in uh, other places as well. It's from Leonard Green. Uh, the card is on top. So now with the double backer, it looks like that random card, uh, the color of the other card, comes out of the center of the deck, but it really just comes out of uh, the top of the deck. Just think about a little bit more of how you manage uh, the tricks that you have on you because a lot of the times, this happens with me all the time, you forget what you have. Yeah, You forget and w maybe you do two tricks and you go, okay, what else can I do? Uh, so you want to think about this, load up your pockets and you know each pocket has a different trick. So, so let's say you have a deck of cards in your left pocket, you know, coins in your right pocket, a wallet that has some mentalism tricks in your back left and back right has something else. So now you know you have at least four or five tricks that you can go into without forgetting because each pocket has a, a different effect so that's one great way to manage your pockets other than that just take your routines break them up in sections I say pick ten let's say you pick nine routines yeah break them up three 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 so when you do your walk around gigs you do three over here three over here three over here and then you can rotate that cycle around I think that's a really good way to do it the second way I do it is with this production I'm gonna slip cut and kick the card out all right so in slow motion you're gonna do a slip cut like that, right finger, right first finger kicks this card out in a spinny motion. It's gonna swirl, twirl along uh, uh, off the third finger, the middle finger, okay? So that looks like this. So that looks like this in speed. All right, and you give it a little kick like that. 
that's number two. The first finger is going to split almost again as if you're doing a one hand cut or some other packet cut. So your first finger splits but not all the way. It's just going to split enough to separate and that first finger is going to kick back towards yourself. So separate and kick back towards yourself. Make sure that your finger is out of the way over here because sometimes you put your pinky here. Um, so make sure that's out of the way. This gets split and then it gets shot into your other hand. Obviously you want your other hand here to catch it um, unless you're doing some weird lapping procedure, which I guess you can do. That's pretty funny actually. Um, but you want your, your right hand here to catch it. So I do this, I do this and you catch it. So you can do this whole thing where you tie like a string around it and then you pull it. Um, it's just a nice little thing where you go here, cut the deck and then it cuts uh, automatically for you. Boom. I know the mentality because sometimes I used to do this as well. You do the control, you think in your head, oh, I didn't do it so well. So let me just reinstill the fact that it's lost by shuffling and you go into that. Um, it's something that you just try to stay away from as much as possible because again, in my opinion, of course, um, it leads to the fact that, oh, you're doing something quick with your hands and I want to be the type of magician, uh, card handler, whatever you want to call it, that if I'm going to do something, I do it very smooth and different from your typical card trick, okay? So the key card effect goes as follows. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this is what it is. A spectator selects a card, and the way that we're gonna find the card is by knowing the bottom card, which is called the key card. So the bottom card is going to be noted when you do a kick cut like this. The card is gonna be placed back. The ace of hearts, for instance, now we're gonna remember that, gets placed on top of their selection. So I don't know what their selection is, but I know that my card is the Ace of Hearts. So now I know that here, right underneath the Ace of Hearts is their card, the Five of Hearts. So now we know that, okay? Another way to get a key card is to just dribble the card. So they select the card, let's say it's that. As they put it back, I dribble and I just bend, right? So I bend the cards like that and I get, oh look, key card here. So as I do this, they stop, I put the, they put the card back and I just bend this up so I can see three of hearts, all right? So now I remember three of hearts. Now that I know the three of hearts, they can put their card back, this is their selection, I place this, and I, it's just a quick peek, like that, and then I do that. Fan, place your card back on top. As I come here, this comes here. Continue the fan. Now the card is on top, so now you can very slowly place this on top, and that card gets controlled. I like this control because it's very open. You could actually dribble the cards here and go ahead, place your card back. Now you come back, do it, and now pick this packet up and dribble on top like this. So you don't have to rush this control that much. Another thing you can do is dribble, go ahead, place your card back or take that card, go ahead, place it back, show it around to everybody, blah, blah, blah. As you come back, you do this. Now you can pick it up and as I toss it back, you can palm off the card if you wish. I never do this, but it is an option. But I do want to talk about one thing that I use all the time, and that's the number seven force. Now the seven force is something very, very cool that you can use for other things too. Just even making a prediction, writing down a seven on a piece of paper and then having them say it and you've predicted it. Now the way that you do the seven force is very easy. You just ask somebody, hey, give me a number one to 10. Now, when you ask them something like this, Usually they're gonna say seven. More than not, they're gonna say seven, but there's a lot of things that you can do to actually make them say the number seven, which is the force number, even more. So if you were to just ask somebody, give me a number one to 10, they might say seven, five out of 10 times, right? But the way that I sort of put touches on it, I wanna say that eight out of 10 times, nine out of 10 times, I get them to say the number seven. And here are the subtleties that I use for that. So the first thing is what I actually say. I say, if you were to give me a number from one to 10, what would it be? Right before I say that, I put my hands like this to my face, and then I go like this in front of their face, okay? Like this. And what I'm doing is I'm actually putting up the number seven with my fingers in front of their face, all right? Doing something like this or drawing in the air, the number seven, you'd have to do it sort of backwards, I guess, to them. It does work, okay? So you could either go, give me a number one to 10, it really doesn't matter. Give me a number one to 10, say it out loud. If you were to give me a number one to 10, what would it be? And I place the number seven like this, okay? And curl your fingers a little bit, you don't wanna go like this. If you were to give me a number one to 10, what would it be? Give me it, just tell me, what was it? No? So I do something called a stutter. Now what the stutter is, is I don't know how good it picked up on video, but I say this. If you were to give me a number one to 10, what would it be? Do the seven, 
And as they're saying it, I straight, I, I don't wait for them to respond, I go s say it. So I actually stutter the word say it or the phrase say it. And before that I go s s say it, all right? So I go s s twice to get them to mimic me in the phrase and they just come out and they go seven. All right, it's the weirdest thing, you have to try it out. So if you were to give me a number one to 10, what would it be? Go s s say it. So they might think there's something wrong with you a little bit, but I think it's worth it for you to get the, the force down. Here's the top card. I kick cut, maybe more. And now from the break, because we don't want to break, I'm going to do a step, just literally nothing fancy to it. I just kick this over and that's about it. Just so you can see the card. Okay. So that's step number one. You want to see the card. Um, I'm going to hold it up just like this and I'm going to start to spread. As I start to spread, I go one finger, please. I tell the spectator one finger, they mimic this action and then I go, please touch the back of a card. So now I see the card the whole time. I'm going from up to down and the, and the line, please touch the back of a card is very important because look what happens. If I'm doing this and I say, please touch the back of a card, they're not gonna reach their hand around, right? It's really awkward to reach their hand around uh, and try to touch the back of a card right now. They're gonna wait and they're gonna wait. And as I come down, I see their fingers coming down. As I come down, that's when I get to the position here. Let's turn the face up so you can see. That's where I get to the position of where the card is. One finger, please. Please touch the back of a card. And I wait as I come down, their hand comes down. As I come down more, their hand comes down. And they touch, All right? You time it, the timing is that much better. And I just push it in front of their, their, and they take it out just like that, okay? But here are the problems that people have when trying to do the move. First and foremost, the biggest thing is that the main thing is the hand motion, right? When you push it in and then you want to try to palm it and you get one of these things, yeah. right? Yeah. So the way that we fix this problem is figure out why it happens. So as I push the card in, a lot of times, this is what happens, it gets stuck on the pinky, all right? And if it gets stuck on the pinky, then you go, oh, you can't go through the pinky, duh. So you got to move your fingers out of the way. When this finger moves, this finger moves. When this finger moves, this finger moves. And then all you get is spastic behavior. You know, we don't want that. Um, so don't get it stuck on the pinky and the way we don't get it stuck on the pinky is to obviously take your fingers out of the way So I like to take my finger up and place my pinky as far back as po far, far up as possible So that it's ready to get the card Okay, so I mean you could do it as well. You can see the difference for from here Get your pinky and just move it. Yeah, just like that. So now when you push it in you're pushing it a diagonally the pinky's ready to steal it out. So you're already halfway there. So I'm gonna do a double lift at this point and you show that the four of hearts. So at this point what you're gonna do is you're going to turn your back and put it behind your back. Okay, so you're turning around and you're gonna have the spectator print their name here. So you can even underline it or circle it so they know that this is where they have to print um, because you know layman could be weird and they're probably gonna write it like in the heart or something. I've seen weird things happen. In any case, you tell them you're gonna print your name here, but I'm gonna turn around so I can't see and I'll hold the deck like that. So go ahead, just write a name. Good. So now you're going to do the double lift. So if you have a break, if not, you try to do the push off all fancy. But in this case, I would have had a double lift because that would be hard behind the back. So I'm here. I have my break. I take it. I turn it over. I thumb it off and I push it face down. So now all attention is on here. I put the card on the table. As I place it on the table, remember, I've switched it out for this right here. So I'm going to turn the deck end for end. I said, and you could have picked any card, right? And now I'm going to do a gambler's cop. And now from behind, this is exactly what I'm doing. I see the name Debbie. Okay. So show the card, show it, get the break. As I come eye level, as I do this, I'm going to take the card, move this out, move this down. Okay. So it's going to look like that. All right? And it should be a very free motion. I like this version because of, of the way that you're acting with the hands and it works for me because all the time I talk and I gesture with the hands, I point, I do this, um, and it works. Okay, so you show the card, go ahead, and you actually push it in. So now at this point, you tell the spectator uh, to keep their eyes on their card. And as you go to square everything up, your right hand culls or moves the selected card to the right, your right, as you keep spreading with the left hand, and this is gonna go to the bottom of the deck. 
just like that. So before anything, I want to show you the exact technique of how to palm a card, just in case you don't know. Uh, it should be between the pinky and the the base of the thumb right here. Now, if you notice your thumb, when you do, uh, when you squeeze it like this, there's two sets of, I guess, wrinkles that happen, and the corner should be in that one that's more towards you. This is more to palm a coin, and then over here is what you need to palm the card. So it's here and it's the pinky. And this makes, I think, the best technique, the most natural technique uh, when palming the card, just like that. Okay, so keep that in mind. You don't need to go full out and like have all your fingers on the card. It could be more natural, okay? You can hold the deck like this after you have the card palm, drop it and say that wasn't your card, whatever the trick may be. Then you're gonna come here and then come and then you're just going to swipe away and all I'm doing is I'm dropping like that and I'm squaring with these fingers. Now these fingers shouldn't be out like this and then close. They should be just there just so we could give it a little squeeze. So you're here, drop, squeeze just a little bit so that it's squared up and then move away. All right, so it looks like this and then that. All right, and you get a little bit of a swipe action just like this. Okay, and then slowly you can come back to a more natural position with your hand. What is your go-to routine? So, I have a few go-to routines that I do. As far as a go-to routine when it comes to non-card magic related, the mismade bill is something that I talked about in my previous video, and it's one of the best close-up tricks that you can do. I think there's nothing better, and when you're gonna do a bill switch, I don't think it's, in my opinion, good to do a dollar bill to a hundred dollar bill, because the audience, what are they gonna say? Oh, how did you switch the bill? Because they know you can't just magically turn one to a hundred. How did you switch it? This is their main question. So I believe when you're gonna do a bill switch, it's better to take a one dollar bill, do it into a mismade bill, then give it out to them. That is the best. So the presentation is this. Look, I have a deck of cards here, and uh, I want you to think of your favorite card. Do you have a favorite card by any chance? They say it, and at this point, I'm gonna go and find it, but because the presentation is going to be, I put a card in my pocket from before we started, all right? So the idea is that you wanna steal the card that they name and put it in your pocket. One little tip for this is that I would have a queen of hearts, which I do in my wallet anyway. Uh, I have one card here. Uh, in my wallet from a red knock deck and it's the queen of hearts now why do I do this if they say queen of hearts then it's a hit and usually females would say queen of hearts if you ask them for their favorite card so I always this is just a little extra little bonus I always keep one card in my wallet it's the queen of hearts along with my baby picture that's my baby picture right there you can tell it matches don't you dare laugh at that I heard you all right, um, so I keep all these weird things in here, but I do have one card just in case they see the Queen of Hearts, I could go straight into this. So uh, the way that I did this, the crimp, is to literally take it, turn it face up like this, and you're going to take your thumbs, place it in the middle, and kind of make an X. Uh, you're putting pressure here, and putting pressure here, and you're going to slide it like that, turn it here, and from the middle, slide your fingers out to the corners like that, almost making like an X, okay? Or you can even go from the corners here and pinch up, you're pushing down, and then here as well. Now what that's gonna happen is once the card, let's say it's on top, if it gets cut into the middle, it has a crimp, it has a little bit of air in it, okay? This is exaggerated, you don't want it that much, but what that's gonna allow it to do is when you cut the deck, it's on top, okay? Now if you want the card on top, you do the crimp with the card facing up. If you wanted the card on the bottom, you do the crimp with the card facing down, okay? Uh, but for the, in this case, we, we want it on top, so we have the crimp with the card facing up. Boom, boom, cut. And now when you do any kind of cut, chances are, now this is not 100%, but chances are it's gonna cut to here. It's very important for me because I love magic, right? As all of you do, and I hate magic at the same time. I hate it. I hate magic tricks. I hate certain tricks and gimmicks and and uh, all the all the characteristics of magic like uh, please pick a card, I'm gonna find it, okay? So my whole thinking along many years of traveling the world, I've traveled and I've lectured all over, just not Paris, the first time I lectured in Paris. Um, I've traveled 126 <coughs> cities and lectured all around. And I performed, and I met people from all over. And it's very important for me to make a, make a difference and be different with everything that I do uh, in magic. Because everybody here is different, yes? And everybody here wants to do magic to stand out. 
But then, we learn a trick, we buy a trick, we show it to somebody, we make them laugh a little bit, and then we think we're good, and we stop trying to expand. All right, so my whole thinking is how do we take something simple and make it as magical, as powerful as possible for the people that you're showing it to. Does that make sense? All right. Okay, so my opinion, what mistake magicians make uh, most? I think that a lot of the times magicians feel that there's, sort of, there's a certain arrogance and a I'm too good for everything. And the problem with that is that you stop learning, you think you're very good from the start because you could do a double lift and, and get the crowd jumping up and down. And because of that, the passion dwindles and you don't feel the need to actively go out, perform and make yourself better. I don't think at any point in magic or in anything else, you should be satisfied and say, okay, I'm good now. And look, I'll be honest, I used to do that myself when I was in high school I wasn't very popular and I used to do magic and then all of a sudden I was the best thing that happened in that high school um, I had friends and there were girls and the teachers loved me and I got and I got away with skipping class and things like that all, all from magic and then I just thought to myself hey look I'm too good for uh, people and I was obviously very young but nonetheless then I stopped showing magic to people when they asked hey can you do a trick no, no, no. I had this arrogance to me, and I realized over time that this, this did not help me at all. It did not help me improve magic. It did not help me become a better person. It did not help me meet new people. So then moving forward, I started doing it to everybody, and you don't know how many people you're going to meet, come across, that will influence you or you influence them relationships, connections, all of that stuff. It all starts with you taking a step back, realizing that you're not the best at everything and there's always room for improvement, and always have the passion to learn, learn some more, and then when you're done learning, keep learning. All right, guys, there you have it. That was the video. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for sticking around. And thank you so much for the 100,000 of you out there that keep pushing me to do what I love to do, which is share magic with you guys. My last piece of advice here for you guys is to never stop sharing the magic, especially in today's day. I think it's super important for you to go out there and make people smile and give people that sense of wonder. This is why we all do this. So I hope you take that into consideration and, and, and practice as much as you can, but then go out and perform and have a good time. Until next time, this has been Alex Pandrea, signing out. Peace.